Hello and welcome to the Meditation Conversation, the podcast to support your spiritual revolution. I'm your host, Kara Goodwin, and I can't wait for you to dive into this fascinating episode with Daniel Packard. Daniel has dedicated many years to researching how to get people from managing their anxiety, people-pleasing, perfectionism, and procrastination to actually healing it with a simple and quick method. He has an engineering approach to understanding the world, and he applied that to understanding how people get in these self-sabotaging cycles. You're gonna benefit so much from hearing what Daniel shares, and it's important for you to also know that with his system, you don't pay until you see results. With a 90% success rate, this model seems very much to be a win-win. Daniel Packard is just remarkable and his work is groundbreaking. He's a UC Berkeley mechanical engineer who turned his painful 10-year battle with severe anxiety into a mission to engineer an actual permanent solution for anxiety. After 10 years of research and testing, working with 3,000 people from five continents, Daniel and his research team made the breakthrough discovery that anxiety is not a problem of the mind, but the body. So we're gonna get into that in just a moment, but first for you plant lovers out there, are you familiar with Pure Leaf? Pure Leaf is an alternative and complementary approach to conventional plant care and pest control methods. It's a natural, non-toxic alternative for caring for your plants. There are compounds to help give your plants more vitality and to address plant health issues. As a plant lover myself, I personally love the indoor superfood and nutrient booster. Try Pure Leaf for yourself and use code KARAG20 for a whopping 20% off your order. That's K-A-R-A-G-20 for 20% off. And now enjoy this episode. Well, welcome, Daniel. I am so excited to be connected with you today. Tell us about your journey to your breakthrough discovery about anxiety and fear and what's led you uh, to where you are now. Well, I like to tell my story because it's important that people understand what we've developed because what we're bringing to the world really is innovative. And since we're in an industry where there's a lot of people that overpromise and underdeliver it. Before I get into my story, I always am mindful of your listeners and I always like to be clear about the value of what I'm gonna bring because it really is innovative and it might get missed unless I'm really clear. So firstly, you know, this is a meditation podcast. It's, about, it's called the Meditation Conversation. So um, to your audience, obviously most of them I'm guessing are meditators and I deeply appreciate meditation. I know why people do it. I used to do a lot of it. My best friend was a monk who followed Yogananda and he was a devoted meditator. My business partner is a meditator. So meditation is one of the more beautiful, healthy ways to make life better. However, usually there's something that people are struggling with or that is keeping them from the life that they want that they are using the meditation Four, could be overthinking, could be anxiety, could be uh, worry, could be two in the mind and not in the heart. There's just lots of reasons that people use meditation as a wonderful way to make their lives better and live, be happier, be more focused, whatever it is. And that absolutely works. However, I wouldn't call it a downside, but it's an inefficiency, which is you meditate. And the thing that you're struggling with or you'd like less of or you want more of, you will get some improvement. Wonderful. But the question I ask to you, Cara, and your audience is, is it permanent? It does take continuous choice to keep engaging with it. Very eloquently said, yes, continuous, which is code for you have to keep doing it. Now, that's if it's working, that's great. However, I was speaking to this woman, it was about 10 years ago, and she said, you know, I used to be a, a, a chain-smoking neurotic, and meditation just saved my life. I meditate every morning, and I, it just, I don't smoke, and I'm great. And I thought, that is just wonderful. And, and just the engineer, I mean, the scientist in me, I said, uh, I said, but what happens if you stop meditating? She said, oh, I start smoking, I'm a total neurotic. I went, yeah. which is fine, like, at least you've got something. And that's the only 
downside, the inefficiency is you kind of have to keep doing it, which is not bad, but it's just inefficient. Or you meditate, you get some benefits and it lasts a while, maybe an hour, two hours, three hours. But then, you know, the crunchies and the critters and the, you know, I want to use the fancy Sanskrit words, critters, you know, start to come back. And wouldn't it be nice if either you didn't have to meditate as long or there was the benefits of your meditation lasted longer. And the reason I know that's possible is because when we were developing our system, we, uh, I was going all over the world doing research with different cultures, different religions, different backgrounds, because we wanted to develop something universal that worked for everybody and got much better results. And so I spent five months in Dharamshala, India, where the Dalai Lama lives, and I'm going around there and I'm working with monks. You know, these are, these are elite level professional grade meditators. So I got to work with meditators and I was working with a nonprofit, a nonviolent nonprofit. And many of them to be nonviolent would meditate, you know, to quiet the anger and the ego and the violence. And I started working with them and showing them the tools and the system that we were developing because I said, how long are you meditating every day to kind of keep this nonviolent, compassionate, empathetic? And they said, you know, between one to two hours a day. And I said, first of all, thank you for doing that. That's incredible that you're putting in that much time to be nonviolent in the world and to be compassionate. But would you like to meditate a little bit less and get the same results or meditate the same amount of time and just be more compassionate, just get more results? And they said, sure. So they started using early prototypes of the tools that we were developing and what we saw in these meditators is that their baseline, just their natural state, was becoming more compassionate, more loving, less violent, just naturally. It was, it was, and it was their default. So they had to meditate less to get the same benefits. Or when they did meditate, the benefits lasted longer and longer and longer. So what I'm going to be sharing with you, with your audience, is an, uh, something that can really this probably isn't the best word, turbocharge your meditation. That's <laughs> not the best word, but amplify the results. I'm an engineer. I love results. And so if you're a meditator and you love it, which you should, and maybe meditate less often, maybe once a week instead of once a day, or you love meditating and you want the benefits to last instead of a couple hours, a couple days, if you'd like to just get more benefits from your meditation, I'm going to show you how to do that. How's that, that sound? sounds amazing. All right. So how did you even get, get to this point? I got to this point, and this point is two things. One of the points is the company that I started. Our passion is results, permanent results. There's a lot of things out there, meditation included, which one could argue is managing things, which is wonderful but it's, it's managing. And our passion is not only measurable results, but permanent results. And the reason results matter to me a lot is because growing up, my dad was a physicist and he said, you know, Daniel, anybody can have a theory or an idea, but results matter. It's the person who gets results that really knows what they're talking about. Results matter. And I like that idea that, yeah, you know, anyone can say anything, but results matter. And that love of results and making things that work to get results in, took me to engineering school at UC Berkeley, where I was professionally trained how to look at complex problems and create simple solutions. And then you would build a prototype, but then you would test. You would see, does this thing get results or was it just theory? And then you would test and refine and improve until you get something that works and gets consistent results. And... The good news was I knew how to make machines work, but the bad news was they never taught me how to make life work. Um, and so, yeah, I could make a robot that played ping pong, but I was an anxious, overthinking, insecure, procrastinating, perfectionist, people pleaser. So, yay. And, you know, like a lot of your audience, I go looking for help. So I go to therapists and psychologists and gurus and teachers and coaches. I spent months in ashrams and retreats and sitting at the foot of gurus, even living in the ashrams of, of Yogananda. Again, my best friend was a monk with Yogananda. So I went to India, spent time there, went to the ashram in Italy, spent time there. And I'm working, 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 work. work. And after 10 years and a hundred thousand dollars, you know, what results did I get? Well, things were better. You know, I could manage things better, but it was all still there, which 
just isn't great results. I wanted to be free of this. I wanted to be free to just be an open-hearted, confident, um, loving person, not temporarily and not because I meditated, just it's my default. And I just didn't see that in the market. And I thought, well, for my own pain, but also there's a lot of people out there that are, have things where they're managing, but they'd like to be free of it. So I started my own research company, Full Liberation Technology, with the goal to see if we could reverse engineer a process such that if a person works the steps, they get a permanent result, which is to have a quieter mind, for the anxiety to go away, for the procrastination to go away, the people pleasing, the worry, just it's gone. And we didn't know if it was possible. It was just a goal. And it was way, way, way harder than we, it sounded good when I came up with this, like, ooh, I'm gonna start a company so that people can be free. It was so hard. But the beauty of engineers, Cara, is we are dedicated, passionate problem solvers. Most of the innovation we see is engineers and scientists who aren't the smartest, but they're just dedicated problem solvers. And that's what engineers are. So we spent a total of eight years, um, worked with 3,000 people on five continents, over a million dollars in research and development. But after all that hard work, focused hard work, we cracked the code, which was an understanding of human consciousness so that no matter what you're struggling with, anxiety, overthinking, worry, negative self-talk, um, procrastination, people-pleasing, low self-esteem, uh, we have a system where at the end of the system and working the steps, the symptom is gone and not coming back. And it's measurable. We measure you as you go through it with several emotional biomarkers. And because results matter so much to us, when people work with us, you, do not, you don't pay at the beginning because we haven't gotten you results yet. You pay us at the end of the six-week process once what you're struggling with is gone and not coming back. And we do that for two reasons. One is what we've done is a real innovation. And people don't trust innovations. They'll say, it sounds too good to be true. I've had this my whole life. You can't get rid of this in six weeks. I'm like, I know, be skeptical. I totally get it. But you, you only pay at the end when you get results. And that helps skeptical people be open and we get to help them. So that's one reason we do it. The other reason is results matter. When people are in pain and you're struggling, understanding's nice, insights are nice, tips are nice. People want results. They want to be free, to be happy and fulfilled. And if we can't get you that result, it just doesn't feel right to charge people. We want to get you to happiness. We have a 90% success rate, but when we can't, we don't charge you because it's not right. And so when you talk about a system, is this, talk a little bit about what this system is. I, I'm still not clear. Is this a technology? Is it a device? Is it um, a series of steps with breath work or what, what is the, um, what's the protocol like? Excellent, excellent, excellent question, Cara. Thank you. Um, there's two answers to that sort of like, sounds great, but like, how does it work? It's a technology in that my definition of a technology is something that takes, make, makes something complex, simple, and usually is an improvement and usually is more affordable. That's one definition of technology. And so this is a technology, but it's really an inner technology. There's no device. There's no zapper. There's no waves. It's basically an inner gym. And the reason it gets such great results is for two key reasons. The first off is it's a system. So what does that mean? Well, as we know in life, systems make complicated things simple and it lays out steps. But there's two parts to a system. One is to get anything done in this world fast and efficiently, usually you need a complete set of tools to get the job done. If you're a contractor, you have contracting tools. If you're a dentist, you have dentistry tools. If a, if a contractor showed up to your house and you were hiring them to renovate your house and they had a hammer and they were like, we got a hammer. I am really, really good with this hammer. I got a hammer. That's great. But would you be a little bit suspicious that maybe they can't get the job done if all they have is one tool? Yeah. Yeah. But when I went looking for help, for the most part, I would go from therapist to psychologist to guru to coach. And usually it was like one or two tools here 
and I would try it and work and work and work and work. And then I would fail, beat myself up, think I was broken and something wrong with me. Then I'd go to another teacher, coach or guru and learn about their tips and tools and try and try and try and fail. What we've developed is an optimized toolkit, all the tools in one place that have been designed and optimized and tested to work together to get the job done, address the root cause. So A, that's one part. But also I want to tell your audience, part of the reason you haven't, you're not free of what you're struggling with is not your fault. You need multiple tools working together that are designed to work together. And that's not offered usually. So if you're listening to this and you still have the overthinking or the worried mind or whatever it is you're struggling with and you blame yourself and you think there's something wrong with you, you're broken. It's not your fault. It's that this industry usually gives individual tools for management, but not a comprehensive toolkit to address the root cause. The second part that you need for a system that isn't out there usually is, well, let's say, let's say you had a friend who tasted a chocolate chip cookie and they thought, this is the most delicious thing ever. I want to know how to make chocolate chip cookies. And you hand them everything they need, the complete toolkit to make a chocolate chip cookie, all the ingredients and all the tools, the bowls, the whisk, the oven, everything they need to make a chocolate chip cookie. But they did not know how to bake at all. Even if they have everything they need, are they going to be able to make a chocolate chip cookie? No. Why? They need to know the steps and the process yeah yeah you need the instructions yeah. like do i take the egg and throw it in the oven do i take the whisk and sing and into it <laughs> what do i do with the flour do i put it on my face and like what do you do you don't know what you have is the instructions what to do in what order in what amount for how long every little thing is measured and when we looked at what was available that's not what we get in personal development and spirituality. It's usually like you learn a tool and it's, for me, it was like, good luck. You know, here, quiet the mind. Good luck. Here's some breath work. Good luck. And I would fail. And then I beat myself up and think I was broken. No, we have the two things you need. A complete comprehensive toolkit that addresses the root cause, but also super simple, easy to follow instructions. You do this on this day, for this amount of repetitions, for this long, next day, do this, this amount of repetitions for this long. It's really simple, easy to follow, so you can't get confused and fail. And the reason that matters to us is we want two results. One is to help people be free, but also we don't want you to fail and then feel crappier about yourself. I know that pain. And when you are sold things that set you up for failure, you end up failing and beating yourself up. So you have all the instructions needed to make things simple. When your symptom arises, approximately five times a day for five minutes. And when you apply the tools in the order that we say to the symptom that you're struggling with, over the six weeks, you heal the root cause and the symptom either goes away permanently or goes way down permanently. Wow. And so how, how do you measure that? Because you mentioned that, you, it, that it's verifiable and you know, you kind of made that point early on that if you if you don't know what the results are, then there's nothing there for it. You know, there's no substance there. But how were some ways that you measured that? Again, excellent, excellent. These are sometimes when I'm on podcasts, the person is just, I'll just say it, cynical. It's fine to be skeptical, but they're just cynical. And I'll just be sharing this thing that we spent eight years working on and we had this incredible thing where we don't charge. And instead of saying, wow, that's really impressive. I don't know if what you're doing is true, but like, I'm impressed. I'm open. They just keep like shooting me down and you're understandably skeptical, but you're asking good questions. You're like curious, but you're asking the right questions. So I appreciate oh, you. Well, well thank for that. you. I appreciate it. I, I think it does sound amazing. I, I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Oh, so sorry. I got pulled <laughs> into the lovey dovey <laughs> moment of appreciation. What was your question? I was curious about learning more with how you measured the results. Yes. We call them emotional biomarkers. So the symptoms that most people come to us are for anxiety, people-pleasing, procrastination, overthinking, pe uh, perfectionism, and low self-confidence. Things like caring what people think of you, needing people to like you. Um, 
And each of those, it took a while to create one to 10 measurements that can give you a profile of that particular pain point. For anxiety, for instance, you can measure it from one to 10 for you. Is it a one? Is it a 10? Then there's the peak. You know, what was the worst it got today from one to 10? That, that biomarker is different than what was your average, but also how long did it last throughout the day? So we have an app and as the client goes through our program, you are reporting online uh, two to three times a day your data. And we have create. it took a while to create sort of a containment for each of the pain points. For instance, procrastination is a lot easier to track. We look at basically how much time did you spend avoiding what you wanted to do? And it's very easy. You just measure. Also, how much time did you spend doing what you wanted to do and what you love? And you can keep track of it. Also, uh, most procrastinators can't stay focused for a very long time. They sort of start and stop and start and stop. So we will measure one of our biomarkers is what was your consistent focused workflow throughout the day? That's just an example. So for instance, a gentleman, uh, Martin from the UK went through our program three months ago. He had tried, I mean, literally everything, hypnosis, meditation, things to control his procrastination, goal setting, all everything. And he said, I met somebody at a conference who worked with you. He was a procrastinator. He wasn't living the life he wanted to live. And he said that you only charge at the end. And he said, wait, what? Who? I'm what? Uh, and so for him, his, this is only in six weeks, his procrastination time, meaning how long it took him to get started on something went from 90 minutes down to about seven wow. minutes in six weeks. The amount of time that he got to work on what mattered to him and love went from about 15 minutes up to three and a half hours per day. That's in six weeks. And his focus time, this was the great part, uh, basically went from, I think, five minutes at a time before he would distract himself to an hour to two hours. He would just get into the zone and be in purpose and joy and fulfillment. That is remarkable. So the short answer is we can measure and you, the client, self-report every day your data. And so you can track your trend as you go through the system. Does that answer your yes, question? Yes, and how many people are on medication for those exact things? That's incredible. You know, if, if you aren't able to stay on task and all this avoidance and the, you know, there are a lot of people using medication to try to overcome those types of things. So not only being able to do that in that amount of time, but also naturally is, that's incredible. What a huge opportunity. Thank you. It is yeah. incredible. I will own my greatness. Uh, it's also a result of care and just a basically a crap ton of focused hard work, but it is incredible. And so thank you for appreciating. And it is natural. There's no pills. It's not a trick. I'll explain to you how we're getting these results. But it's also, you know, he was a meditator because even though one of his symptoms was procrastination, part of the reason he had procrastination is because he had a very critical overactive mind that kept sabotaging him doing things. So that's one reason that people meditate is to quiet their mind. And so not only... Because our approach is going to the root cause, not only did his procrastination basically get cleared up, but also his mind went quiet. Mm. And my mind has been quiet for eight years straight. I used to have a critical, overactive mind that just used to beat the living crap out of myself. You know the, you know the judges from the Muppets? Do you remember them? <laughs> yes. Those guys were in my mind on meth. Just, you're unlovably ugly. What's wrong with you? No matter how, it's just constant, constant. And I would have to meditate to quiet those judges in my mind. And because I'm one of the early test cases of our system, my mind, it's just dead quiet. It's just quiet. And when it does talk, it says nice things. I look in the mirror and I'm like, I do me. I love me. I adore me. And... So for you meditators out there with an overactive critical mind, I am telling you it's possible just to have a mind be quiet permanently and stop beating the crap out of you. Not temporarily, it, it permanently. And it is 
awesome is, when your mind is not cannibalizing your that, joy. The value in that, I mean, I really feel that is one of the huge hurdles that much of humanity is here to overcome um, or that's kind of gotten baked into the living existence that is this almost like a an artificial, you know, it wasn't really, it's not really part of who we are naturally, you know, from a, a higher standpoint. And it's just this like residue of human life. And so being able to work with the overly critical mind is, is huge. That's amazing. We, you just said two very true and profound things, very articulately said, baked in like it's almost in there was another one you said that was very eloquent but the point is there's two things that are baked in one is yes the average person is walking around with this negative self-talk that's demoralizing them demotivating them lowering their self-esteem slowing them down but also just scaring the living crap out of them and when we're in fear we can't be the open-hearted purposeful people we want to do our mind is a real problem but the other reason it's baked into us is because the approach that everybody's been taking is that we're just managing it is just acceptable. Mm, yeah. So what's baked in is the overactive critical mind. And what's baked in is whether it's therapists, psychologists, coaches, gurus, what's baked in is what's best and what's best you can hope for is management. And I'm telling you, you can be free of this. Our clients are free. Now, here's why this is possible. These people say, Daniel, come on, you can't quiet the mind. If your mind, your negative spinning critical mind is a symptom of something deeper, can you see that no matter what you try, no matter how good it is, you'll never be free of it if your overactive critical mind is a symptom? Like there's nothing you can do. I don't care how much you meditate. I don't care how much you learn and understand. If it's a symptom, it'll keep coming. And the best you can hope for is management, which is what people are doing. In reality, the overactive, critical, chattery monkey mind is not a problem. It is a symptom. But we are taught it's a problem, and we're taught it's a problem of the mind. We're told to quiet the mind, stop the negative thinking, quiet the ego in your mind. It's even called mental health. It's got the word mind right in there. So we are taught by the experts that the mind is the root cause. Modern meditation has been around about 5,000 years. Modern psychology has been around about 100 years, focusing on the mind. Anxiety is on the rise. That's horrible results. So the mind is the root cause theory isn't accurate. And we saw that because we were engineers and we weren't attached to any pre-existing paradigm. And we saw the actual root cause, what's causing it and then spreading to the mind. So the negative, fearful, critical thinking is not a problem. Fear, negativity, and criticism, all what's in your mind is not a problem. It's a symptom of what's actually causing it, which is coming from the body. Mm. Okay. Now people will say, oh no, they're interconnected. You know, it, mind, body connection. That's what you're taught. And that's what it seems like because the mind is going banana pants and you're feeling fear. So it looks like they're connected. Now they are connected, but in science, there's a concept called causation versus correlation, meaning something could be correlated, but it's not causing it. If you put a tea kettle onto a flame and you get steam, the steam is happening at the same time as the fire. But the steam is not causing the fire. They're not interconnected. The steam is a symptom. It's correlated. It's showing up at the same time, but the root cause is the flame on the water. And we saw that. So first of all, you'll ask, your audience may say, well, how do you know? And if you actually look closely, it's pretty obvious. When, you're, when your mind is spinning, have you ever noticed that when you're feeling more fear and stress and worry, usually your mind tends to gravitate towards more negative problems? Yes. Absolutely. And when you're feeling a bit calmer, usually your mind tends to notice more good, positive things. Have you noticed yes. that? You're right. And that's in some level what some forms of meditation are. You use breath to quiet the body. You quiet the body, the mind follows. Mm -hmm. Agreed? Right. So just based on that experience, 
what looks to be the cause and what's the symptom? Does it look like the mind is the cause and the body's a symptom? Or does it look more like the body's the cause and the mind is a symptom? Mm. Yeah. I mean, it, yeah. The mind is responding to the body. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's not my theory. First of all, it's fact for two reasons. One is when we developed this program that just focused on the body, calming the body, in all our test cases, myself included, their body calmed down and their mind calmed down. And we didn't do any mind techniques. Their mind just automatically. So that's what the data showed. It's also how we're able to have this program that works. But also it's how we're wired. We are wired such that our body senses what the body needs to stay alive. And then the mind is a tool to get the body what it wants, right? You feel hunger in the body first, then the mind senses the hunger and the mind goes, okay, we better figure out where to go eat. Or if you're, you know, metaphorically in a jungle and you hear a sound, you will feel fear in the body first. You'll go into fight or flight. Your mind then senses that fear and goes, oh God, there's a problem. There's a threat. I better go solve this problem. So we are mechanically wired such that body feels first, then the mind senses that and is a tool to get the body what it needs. Your body, for reasons which I'll explain, is feeling fear. But now there's no more actual threats mm -hmm. that your mind needs to solve. But this is old circuitry. This is your old stuff. It's, it's reflex. So your body is feeling fear. And then your mind senses that fear, thinks there's a threat, thinks there's a problem, and then starts spinning and spinning, worrying about the future and the past and saying there's something wrong with you. It's, it's clamoring, looking for a problem to solve because it feels the fear. Hmm. Wow. Now, do you want to share about you were saying that you will share about why your body um, senses that fear with that old wiring? So the next logical question is, okay, Daniel, if it's not in my mind, why is it in my body? Why am I feeling afraid? Because we're taught by the gurus and the teachers and the experts that your mind starts to say scary things and then the body responds. You know, if your mind is saying you're going to run out of money, you're unlovable, there's something wrong with you, you'll be, you're fired, you're, you know, you'll feel fear. That's true. If the mind says scary things, you will feel fear. So it looks like it's the mind, but it's not. The mind can make the body kind of feel worse. You can get caught into what we call in our company the spin cycle, which is where you feel fear in the body or anxiety in the body first. Then your mind starts saying all this crunchy stuff, which then makes you feel worse. And then you get stuck in this loop. We call it the spin cycle. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yes. Well, the other thing it makes me think yeah. of is sometimes just waking up, you might like feel something in your body, like they're like you're almost holding like a physical uh, response, but because you're just waking up, it's like, oh wait, what was it I was worried about? You do, do you know what I mean? Like when you just wake up and you don't even remember yet what yesterday was like, but it's there's something that you're anticipating. You can tell there's something off, or that's what that made me think of as well. No, absolutely. I used to do that. I mean, we're so used to. Once, even though these thoughts are a response to the body and the mind is trying to save you from an imaginary threat, but like kind of like a drunk friend that is trying to help but gets you into trouble, you start to, I mean, it's going all day. So of course you say, oh, I've got money. What if I'm unlovable? What if I, oh, and, and the thing and my boss and like, you're, we're just conditioned. And then you, I used to wake up in the morning and I had about two minutes of calm. And then my mind would kick in and be like, yeah, not so fast. You got to worry about this. What about what they think of you? What about, oh, and I would just get pulled. And because I'd been that way since I was probably seven years old, it felt normal. And our clients, one of the reasons that this is so effective is they now know that that fear in their body and their overactive mind, where it's really coming from, and they can apply the tools in the moment. Two things happen. One is when you apply the tools, your baseline is going down slowly because you're healing the root cause but also you have a very quick pattern interrupt so that your mind that spin cycle lasts from about instead of being 15 hours or 15 days can go down to about 15 seconds because you have a quick pattern interrupt you know exactly what's going on and you can just stop it by the way i'm having a great conversation you yeah, this is too. really fun i love i love talking to smart people like you that are aware but sharp and Aww, anyway i just you. love very grateful very grateful thank you. very grateful i'm also grateful to your audience uh 
I want to tell your audience, I'm grateful that you're listening to this, but also I'm going to own my greatness. What we're doing is next level effective. We're the literally the only company on the planet. There's a million coaches and therapists on the planet. Not a single one measures results like we do and backs up their results. So there's a one, we're one in a million and what we're doing is innovative and nobody knows about us. So if you're on this podcast listening to me right now, whether you call it miracle, destiny, somebody upstairs wanted you to hear this. So I'm, you should be grateful that you are hearing me. Not because I'm so great, but because you want to be free of this stuff. And when I'm telling you, you can get that freedom. So I mean, that's, that's arrogant. That's just a fact. Well, I won't say you should be grateful. I would invite you to be grateful. The fact that spirit and flow brought you here for this. I love it. Anyway, now also, I used to be a hypercritical, sabotaging person with imposter syndrome. And I just told your audience how great I am and you should be grateful to hearing me. <laughs> so that should be another evidence that I am a living embodiment of my model because I have enough self-love and open-heartedness to just tell um, people without saying sorry. I am incredible uh, and you are lucky to hear me. Anyway, um, not lucky. Oh, Fortunate man. that the, the big wisdom brought you here. And to Cara for creating this podcast and having me on. Okay. Spirituality and psychology is great at giving you theories, ways of understanding what you're struggling with that can give you like a flashlight or a paradigm to understand your struggle. The ego, scarcity mindset, abundance. These are theoretical ways of looking at life and they are helpful. They're valuable. They give you a framework to make sense of things and maybe make a crappy situation better. However, if they solve things, great. But usually theoretical understandings can't get you a fast solution. That's where they're limited. To get that, you want an understanding that is mechanical. Let's say you're at a restaurant and you start choking and two people walk up to you and the first person walks up to you and they say, wow, I see you're really struggling. I think you have a real scarcity mindset around air. I think you're really focusing on your, on your lack of air instead of the, the abundance of air that's out there. And by focusing on the lack of air, you're not letting in the air. And also, I feel like you have a story and your ego is very attached to breathing and living and that's making it worse. And if you could just let go, like let go of the story and the ego and let go, everything would be better. Or somebody walks up and goes, look, this is actually mechanical. You have a bit of Chipotle mechanically blocking your windpipe. That's what you're feeling. I'm going to add pressure to your stomach, which puts pre pressure behind the guacamole. It's going to pop it out and you're going to be able to mechanically get airway into your lungs and you'll be breathing in about 10 seconds from now. Which approach gets us a fast, efficient solution? Spiritual, psychological, or mechanical? mechanical. Why? Because it's to the point and it's addressing what's happening right now with the body yeah yeah it's not saying here's a theory it's saying this is connected to this you are choking not my opinion not a construct you have something caught in your wimp it's mechanics it's real and if we remove it it doesn't care who you are your past your present Nobody has ever been getting the Heimlich maneuver and saying, no, this won't help. My childhood is too messed up. It doesn't matter because it's mechanics. So if you want to solve something quickly and consistently and reliably, a mechanical understanding and a mechanical solution is what you want. So that's not what we're sold. We're not sold mechanical understandings and mechanical solutions. Here's a quick crash course in your inner mechanics. Now, this is an oversimplification. It's not going to address everything. Number one is what I said which is most of what you're struggling with is not a problem of the mind. You're, you were sent to the wrong location by well-intentioned people who I believe had an incomplete understanding of the problem. You have been chasing a symptom and that's why it's still here. So, inner mechanics lesson number one is the problem is not the mind, it is the body then spreads to the mind. So that's the root cause, the body. Next question, where in the body? At the root cause of most of what we're struggling with is usually a symptom of one thing. And that one thing is fear. Can you see that you could say you're anxious or you could say you're just feeling really afraid and you call that fearful feeling anxious or anxiety? Mm -hmm. 
You could say you're a procrastinator, or you could say I'm afraid to start something or finish something. You could say you're a perfectionist, or you could say you're afraid to make a mistake. You could say you have low self-confidence, or you could say you're afraid to be your full self. You could say you're an overthinker, or you could say, well, if my body's feeling fear, then my mind is going to be spinning trying to solve this imaginary problem. So can you see, Cara, that maybe what we're struggling with are all just symptoms and coping mechanisms of feeling fear? Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Makes sense. And, you, and your audience doesn't need me to tell them they're afraid. Like, this is not a newsflash. But it is interesting to say, what if you don't have all these individual problems? What if you're dealing with different symptoms of one thing, which is fear? So we saw that and we said, well, if we want people to be free of this, if I want to be free of this, we have to address the root cause, the fear, which is not coming from the mind, which is coming from the body. And the reason this is possible is because the body is mechanical. There's systems in the body. Systems can break down and fail and have symptoms and you can repair. Your leg can be broken. You can need a root canal. Your body can fail and create symptoms. But the body is a system. It's a beautiful system and it can be repaired. So we said, all we got to do is find the system, create all the fear, figure it out. Why is it failing? And repair it. So what system in the body do you think is making everybody afraid? So take out the word fear, swap in the word nervous. System. Which system in the body you think is making everybody freaking the out? System. The capillary system, the skeletal system, or the nervous system. See the nervous system. Yes. What say you, Kara? I say the nervous system. <laughs> yes, exactly. Pretty obvious. It's got the word nervous right in there. You have a whole planet of nervous people, aka fear. There's a system in the body called the nervous system, which is good news because the body can be repaired. Yet the experts were like, this is a problem of the mind. No, it's not. It's not. It's it's good. The nervous system is your body's mechanical threat response system. And it's designed to sense threats. If it feels there's a threat, you feel unsafe. If you feel unsafe, you will mechanically feel fear. If you feel fear, you will then have a mechanical symptom of fear. So what your audience is struggling with are not problems. The root cause is your nervous system is basically malfunctioning and it's making you feel unsafe from within, inside, body. You feel unsafe from within. You'll then experience that as fear. When you feel the fear, then the symptoms of the fear, the anxiety, the overthinking, the procrastination, the people pleasing, the loss of all of that will then be a symptom. Here is why your body and nervous system feel unsafe. And to show it to you, we'll do a little role play, okay? And this is the simple mechanical explanation of why we feel unsafe, okay? okay? So let's say we're friends. And let's say for a while, I treat you really well, consistently. I'm kind to you, I'm considerate, I'm thoughtful, I know what you need and that matters to me. I put your needs and I make them a priority. And when you really need me, I stop what I'm doing and I'm there for you. And I don't just do this occasionally, it's consistent and you can always rely on me to love you and take care of you all the time. If I treat you that way, will you feel safe or unsafe around me? Safe. Yes. Boom. Mechanics. And the reason you feel safe around me is because that consistent care, you trust me. When you trust me, you feel safe. Right. Make sense? Simple, mechanical. Right. Okay. Now, I would never do this, but for the sake of science, let's say all of a sudden something goes on with me and all of a sudden, out of the blue, for no explanation, consistently, every day, for years, I don't give a crap about you. I'm not considerate. I know what you need, and I put your needs last. I put everybody else way ahead of you, and you get crumbs. When you need me, I'm not there for you. And when you're struggling, I'm not empathetic and understanding. I criticize you and tell you you shouldn't feel this way and to get your problems away from me and get them fixed. And when you really, really, really need me, I am not there for you. If I treat you that way consistently over a period of time, Will you feel safe or unsafe? Unsafe. Yeah, because you don't trust me. And if you don't trust me, I feel like a threat and you'll feel unsafe. So what I'm showing you is that there's a direct mechanical link 
between consistent care and safety. So if somebody treats you poorly over a long period of time, that will leave an accumulation of broken trust and leave a person's nervous system feeling unsafe. We've experienced this from being on the other end of people. They don't treat us very well. We don't feel good around them. You don't feel confident around them. Right. You don't feel, you feel nervous. Well, is it fair to say that we're in a relationship with ourselves? Yes. Is it fair to say that you or maybe your audience sometimes isn't always the loving, caring friend to yourself? Yes. Yes. And what's one way that either you or you see a lot of people not being loving to themselves? The thoughts that we entertain about ourselves and the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves. Yeah. So there's 28 ways that we diagnosed of ways that we need to be good to ourselves. And the most common one that people are aware of is the being hard on ourselves, the negative self-talk. What's wrong with you? You're not good enough. Work harder, beating the crap out of ourselves. It's not nice. Now, your audience knows that. Your audience is like, yeah, I'm not very good, nice to myself. I'm not very forgiving to myself. I'm not very... They know that. What they didn't know is when you are unloving to yourself and unkind to yourself over time, essentially, you break trust with yourself. You feel unsafe within yourself. And when you feel unsafe within yourself, that creates fear in your body. A majority of the fear that you're feeling in your body is not from the past. And it's not from the present. That'll kind of make things worse. A majority of the fear and the unsafety you're feeling is from you to you with little acts every day that build up over time such that you don't feel safe in your own body. That's what's creating the unsafety and the fear. There's another way that people aren't good to themselves. And one is not taking compliments. Mm -hmm. So to you, Kara. Have you ever, or do you now, or do you know people that don't receive compliments? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Now, people know that. They're like, oh, I'm horrible with compliments. Oh, yeah. No, my husband tells me, my wife tells me, oh, I know I'm horrible with compliments. People know it. What they don't know, and what we discovered is th those little acts are leaving you feeling unsafe over time. And I'll show it to you. Let's say again, we're friends, okay? And we're friends, and somebody sees you, and somebody walks up and goes, wow. I see what you did. That's incredible. And I, as your friend, jump in and I say, hey, back off. You get that love and appreciation away from them, all right? They do not deserve to be seen, loved, and cared for and celebrated. They get criticized when they mess up. If I treated you that way, would you feel safe or unsafe? Unsafe. Right. So can you see if what our data showed is that the average person, totally unconsciously and knowingly, because you were never taught, 10 to 30 times a day is just not being a loving, caring friend to yourself. Can you see that over time that would accumulate to leave your nervous system feeling unsafe, creating fear in the body, and then the symptoms of fear? Absolutely. That's amazing. I mean, it, and, it, and tell me what's your smart mind, what's coming well, up for you? Well, one thing is that um, because I feel that when I see and it's and taking a compliment, that's a great example, because that's something that I've had to work on as well, because my knee jerk reaction was always a no, 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 no. And um, it's the, there's a humility piece to it that I think we all misunderstand or that many people misunderstand that that desire to always be humble. But it is that pushing away of saying, no, I'm not going to receive. That's going to bounce right off of me. And I'm only going to pay attention to the criticisms that I get, which are, you know, for a lot of people, those are in abundance. They're not hard to find. So um, I think it does take um, training to be able, it takes awareness at least to be able to say, is this something that I do? And then choosing to work on that because I feel like for so many people that desire to be humble and the you know is um but I don't think it's a true humility it is this um construct that we're putting the word humble in there but it really is a, an act of being unable and unwilling to receive that love well, you're absolutely right. And the reason these patterns are so nasty is A, they happen, and then we use fancy language to justify the violence. It's not humility. It's rooted in unworthiness. I don't deserve to be seen and celebrated. 
that's what's causing it. But of course, we're unaware of these patterns. We deflect the love that we are worthy of. And then because no, most people aren't even aware, and if they are aware, they don't want to see it. No, I'm, I'm being humble. And you know what? I work harder when I, when I'm, I use criticism, you know, and if I ever received, my dad told me this, uh, growing up, he never, I, he never gave me the, I'm proud of you as an attaboys. Never, didn't, uh, theoretically, I might've gotten one or two. I don't remember them. And it stood out to me because, well, every child wants to be appreciated and celebrated by their dad. But I was, again, I'll own my, I was like a super kid. I excelled in all these things and these adults would see it and be like, you're incredible. You're great. I'd be like, thank you so much. I'd go home and like nothing. And I went, it's odd. I should be getting more love in my family and I'm getting less. So I came up with this strategy thinking, well, maybe, maybe it's because I'm not doing things that my dad can appreciate in his value system because at that age, I didn't know my dad was limited and that he grew up and he was traumatized and couldn't say I'm proud of you. So I'm still thinking it's my fault and if only I can do better. So my parents were very into college applications and having a very good, so I thought, ooh, I know. I'll run for class president. I'll win class president. And then I'll tell him I'm class president and he'll have to say, that's great, good job. Because he could appreciate that. So I run for class president. I win. I'm walking home thinking, this is so great. I win class president. I walk in. I tell my dad. All he has to say is good job. I'll know he loves me. Everybody's good. So I walk in totally naive to generational trauma. And I walk in and I'm like, hey, dad. Guess who's class president? And he says, don't let it interfere with your homework. Oh. And I remember this just pain and confusion of like, what? No, all you have to say is good. That's all I got, dude. And I really, I felt this pain and this fear and this unsafety. And I, I started crying. I hadn't shut down yet. And I started weeping and I looked at him and I said, like, what, 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 can't be your, I'm your proud of And he says to me, it's not my job to tell you when I'm proud of you. It's my job to tell you when you mess up. Oh, gosh. And in that moment... Again, I didn't know to hold him accountable. So I think it's my fault. And I unconsciously say, oh, I know why the love didn't come, miss it, it didn't show up. I'm unworthy. I'm un unworthy to be appreciated and seen and celebrated. And that went into my unconscious. And I'm sure your audience can relate to that story in their own way. So we got a little sidetracked. But yes, the reason that we don't care for ourselves is because we have an unconscious belief that we're undeserving of the care. And that's why even if your audience knows, I need to take better care of myself, they don't. Not consistently. Even if you read a book that says self-love is important, self-care is important, you may do it a little bit, but you won't do it at a high level because we unconsciously believe we're not deserving of it. If you think you're undeserving of higher levels of care, you can't give it to yourself. Not consistently. So again, one of the reasons our system works is it's worth being on multiple levels, including the unconscious, and it heals that belief to the point where you feel really worthy of love, really worthy of putting yourself first. I used to be a people-pleasing doormat. It was my default. I knew it was a problem, couldn't stop it because I felt undeserving. As I went through our program, daily, you are using these exercises that not only give yourself the love and care you deserve, but it's conditioning and training you that, hey, actually, you do deserve love. How do you know you're giving it to yourself five times a day through this structure? So now I am the most worthy, boundary setting, need getting mofo on the planet. I know how to speak up, get what I need, set and enforce boundaries. When I need something, I ask for it. And I do it without guilt or shame or lack of apology. When people see me do that, they're like, that's incredible. I asked for what I need. Where'd you learn to do that? I was like, well, you don't learn it. Our program makes you feel worthy of it. So then it's your default and it becomes automatic. That is, it's fantastic. I, I'm, I just love this conversation and I love what you're putting out there in the world. All the research that you've done to get to this point and all the ways that you're helping people to come into that fullness really to improve their life experience. And if we don't do that, if we don't prioritize having the most profound life experience that we can have in the short time that we're here, then what are we here for? You know, 
So I I really applaud you. And I can imagine that people are listening and they want to know how they can get on board with this. So please tell people how they can find out about this six-week program and learn more. So thank you for appreciating what I do. And before I tell you how people get a hold of us, you brought up a word that's very important, which is that it's what we want. People come to us for the symptom, the anxiety, the overthinking, the procrastination, the people pleasing, the low stuff. They come to us for the symptom. But what we're getting them is real freedom from this and real freedom by when you bring the nervous system back to full health, the result is you feel safe within yourself and the fear goes away. So when you feel safe on the inside out, you are free of this stuff and that's who works with us. So if you're listening to this and you're somebody who has anxiety or anxious thoughts and you have things to manage it, you understand it, but you'd like to be free of it, we help people get that every day. We can help you get that quickly. If you're a procrastinator and you have tips and tools and insights and it's better, but you'd like to be free of it so you can wake up every morning, spend hours a day doing what you love, doing what matters to you, bringing value to the world so you feel fulfilled. If you want that quickly, we help people get that every day. We can help you get that. If you're a perfectionist and you'd like to be free of the perfectionism so you're okay to make mistakes, you're okay to be spontaneous and free and just express yourself and not care about the outcome so you can be the natural authentic, free, spontaneous person you want to be. We get people that every day. If you have low self-confidence, you're managing it, you're understanding it, it's getting better. But oh my God, if I could be free of that, if I could not care what people think of me and I could just show up in the world authentic, how that would affect my job, being a parent, being a partner, my relationships. If you'd like to have that be your default, we get that, pe we get that to people every day. Come find us. You can come find us at danielpacker.com. You can either have what we call a, a, a next steps call where you just tell me what you're struggling with. And once I understand your unique situation, I will give you some simple actionable steps that'll move you in the right direction of feeling safer and less fearful so that your symptom goes away. Or if you like what you're hearing, you're like, Daniel, you had me at free and you're interested in the six week program, reach out to me from the website, uh, book a free quick call with me. And if it's a fit, you start the program, you can start to feel better within a few days from now. And again, you don't pay at the beginning because we haven't helped you yet. You only pay at the end when you have clear, measurable data that what you're struggling with is gone and not coming back. If that intrigues you and you want to talk to me, go to danielpacker.com, either for the next steps call or to find out more about our program and see if it's a good fit for you. Go to danielpacker.com and book that call. Thank you so much, Daniel. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate you being on today. It has been an absolute honor. Thank you for having me, Cara.